Hello and welcome. I'm Patrick Curtis, your host and chief monkey, and this is the Wall Street Oasis podcast. Join me as I talk to some of the community's most successful and inspirational members to gain valuable insight into different career paths and life in general. Let's get to it. In this episode, Sam explains his path from the Ivy School of Business to an investment banking analyst position at Credit Suisse in London, right during the financial crisis in 2008. We learn why he turned down a return full-time offer from Scotiabank and rolled the dice his senior year, what it was like when half his analyst class got laid off within nine months at Credit Suisse, and why he jumped to a hedge fund after two years in IB. We then delve into what it was really like trying to gain responsibility at a large hedge fund to start running his own P&L, how much his first trade was, the stresses of the job, and some important life lessons he learned along the way. Don't miss this one. I think a lot of you will really appreciate Sam's perspective and why he made such a dramatic change after so many years. Also, if you want to hear more about what Sam's up to, visit his blog at samuelandrew.com. Enjoy. All right, Sam, thanks so much for joining the Wall Street Oasis podcast. Thanks for having me, Patrick. It should be great if you could just give the listeners a short summary of your bio. Sure. My bio, uh, where to start? Um, maybe a helpful place to start for, I guess, a lot of people listening to this is I, I did work in finance. Actually, my first day in investment banking was September, I believe it was 15th, 2008, which was actually a pretty remarkable day, if I recall the actual day correctly. That was the day uh, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. And I was working in London at the time. I was a first year analyst. And coming out of the tube station in Canary Wharf, the Lehman Brothers building is right there. And I was shocked by seeing all these camera crews everywhere and reporters and these people pouring out of the Lehman Brothers building with boxes of stuff and teary ride and totally shocked. And I had no idea really what was going on. The reality was I don't think anybody had an idea what was going on, mm -hmm. but I showed up a couple buildings over to the credit police office, wondering whether or not my key fob was going to work. And sure enough, it did to my surprise and sat down on my desk and not really knowing what to do. And no real communication, I recall, came around and we just started working on stuff the staffer was telling us to do. And that oh, so you, was the beginning. Like, that was like your first day out of training, basically. Th that was the first day out of training. So I had been in London a couple months earlier to mm -hmm. do the first year analyst training. That would have been over July and August. And just for the listeners, you went to school in Canada, right? At Ivy? Yeah. So I, I grew up in Toronto and yep. then graduated from Ivy in 2008. Yep. Okay. Great. And then moved directly to London. And so what I just described was my, you know, my first foray into the job world and investment Crazy banking. Day. And it was a crazy world. What a crazy day to start. Yeah. But the reality is I didn't know any different. I had no prior experience. So for me, it was just, that was just the way it was. Right. Right. And so this turmoil that everybody else, the VPs, certainly the managing directors were realizing just how crazy a world we were in. Mm -hmm. It was for me, it was like, oh, this is just how things operate. Right. And, and so that's what started two years in investment banking. Where I see you got some restructuring experience. Was that because you were pulled in to that side of the business more because yeah. it was so busy? Yes. Yeah, so there was a lot of that going on. I joined partway through my analyst career. I joined uh, the financial sponsors group at Credit Suisse, which pre-global financial crisis was doing all the LBOs. And post-financial crisis, somehow we retained all the same customers, the clients, which were the private equity firms shockingly. And now we're doing all the restructurings for all the LBOs we had helped finance them. It's somehow that, that relationship did not sour. So yeah, there was lots of uh, restructuring experience. Truth be told, my, my two-year career in banking, I only did three deals. And those three deals lasted the entire two-year period, one of which was particularly agonizing that went on for eight months of my 24-month banking career. Mm -hmm. And after banking, 
as is the kind of the, often the case through analyst programs, especially set to your analyst programs, even six months into the analyst program, we started meeting with the various recruiters. And yeah, I don't know if myself, you know, but now it's like literally right after training they get they get hit up. So, well, funny you mentioned I was I still get contacted by you know people kind of interested in the hedge fund space and yeah kind of what was going on and now they're telling me right, right out of college they're getting recruited yeah. which is nuts but that's maybe a whole separate topic so to continue on my bio which maybe now is less brief <laughs> uh, I then joined a hedge fund called Blue Mountain Capital in the par- 2010 mm-hmm. Uh, Blue Mountain at the time was a credit-focused hedge fund. I joined the firm in London where they were building out their European business, which was investing in credit, performing credit, uh, kind of special situations credit and distress credit across Europe, which then proved to be a really interesting time to be investing in European credit given kind of 10, especially 11, 12, 2011 and 2012, there was the European sovereign debt crisis. And so there was all sorts of interesting opportunities to do. So I got really ingrained into that world. The firm started doing really well. It had already done pretty well, but then there was just a boom in assets. I joined, there was about 4 billion of capital that click in the span of four years, that probably became- tripled? Oh yeah, oh, sorry. Um, more so in, the, so in the span of three or f- probably four years, um, that four billion grew to twenty-two billion, and wow. with that came all sorts of other opportunities for other investing. I then relocated with the firm to New York, which is where it was based, and refocused my efforts on a long short equity strategy, which had been incubated internally. And I joined that team and helped build out that business. And then in part way through 2018 and kind of this had been building for a little while, I decided to leave for a whole bunch of reasons we can discuss. Part of it was a kind of realization of like, is, is this really it? Is this what I'm, what I'm supposed to be doing? And I wasn't sure about that anymore. And kind of my life had plateaued a little bit. I wanted a bit more of a challenge. And so I, I embarked on a different adventure and kind of left that world behind and took a hiatus from it. And a couple of years later, um, you know, describing what I do is a little bit more challenging or not challenging, less simple or less simple. Previously, it was, ah, I work at this hedge fund and everybody knew certainly in the in, in New, York. New York and the Wall Street <laughs> kind of parlance. It was like, ah, I work at this hedge fund. This is the name of the hedge fund. People know what it is. Yeah. And there was an immediate kind of stamp of approval or certainly the stamp of approval that I saw. It. And, and then now it's, there's a number, it's, you know, there's a number of different things I do. And so what I, I think more in terms of how I spend my time and there's three things I spend my time on one, I, I I still invest though, mostly in kind of private companies, businesses that I can uh, play a kind of a role as a strategic uh, partner investor. I also spend t- uh, time writing, which has proven to be an amazing uh, creative outlet. And to my surprise, people are interested in what I have to say, which I never thought <laughs> was going to be the case. And you have and a site, right? What's, what's the domain of your site? So yeah, so can people that. can check out uh, if they're interested in learning more what I'm about and what I've been thinking at samuelandrew.com. Um, and feel free to check it out, reach out, subscribe, um, and hit me up. And the third thing is I've really gotten into endurance sports and marathons have been my, are my primary discipline for now and a few marathon goals and kind of ideas of what I could do thereafter. Very cool. So I want to start all the way back at, you know, maybe even before college, but college for sure. All right, let's rewind. Of, let's rewind because um, some interesting stuff. We can, I, I'll definitely have some questions around uh, how things evolved at the hedge, at your long hedge fund career. But I think just to give people a little bit of perspective of how you even started in banking and how you got yeah. in, you know, Ivy, super well known, probably top business school, right? Um, up in Canada. So it's not surprising. They sent a lot of bankers were you kind of freshman year gung-ho knew you knew you wanted to do banking or how long did it take for you to (laughs) realize this is the path and why london so 
I had I had gotten a taste of it. I knew nothing what investment what investment banking was. I my father was an architect and became kind of grew uh, a practice um, based out of Toronto with a few partners of him that became like a, a pretty sizable business. My mother was a school teacher turned principal. So the connection to finance in our family was just not there. Like we had no idea kind of wall street stuff was not a topic of discussion. Um, but my older brother went to Ivy. And so through him and some of his friends, I got a bit of a sense of kind of this world. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, what attracted me to banking was people just told me this is a really hard job to get. And it was if you're at the top of your class, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna get interviewed by these banks. And if you're really good, you're gonna be at one of the global banks. And if you know, if you really want to hit it, then you should be at one of the global banks in New York or London. That's not don't take that for gospel. That's not at all true, but that's what I thought, right? Mm-hmm. And I became a bit of a product of the environment, which the environment was not necessarily correct. Um well, that's that's and, very the group think around you know on Wall Street Oasis. There's a lot of yeah. There's a yeah. lot of there's a lot of you know. There's been a little more respect, I think, given to some of the boutique banks now, and they realize you can actually have an incredible career there. Um, but for sure, for a long time, it was like bulge bracket or bust. We saw that. Luckily, that that phrase is gone. <laughs> By the way, I haven't yeah. seen it as often. Um, yeah, which is good. Um, so yeah, so yeah for me, I was gung ho on banking and gung ho on a global bank, and it had to like be, freshman year. You knew that, like coming in. So, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. So you, Maybe, you technically not fresh, uh, um, whatever freshman sophomore. You kind of like got yeah. Into by the it. time, probably you know, by the time recruiting started, mm-hmm. six months or so before recruiting started. I was clued in that that this is what I was going to do, and I was going to do it because of partly because of the notoriety that came with it. Yeah, and the competition. competition. Yeah, I yeah. I strive for a challenge, and it was competitive, and people said it was going to be hard, yeah. and so I, you know, I was like, okay, well, I'll show you, I can do this. Right, exactly. That was the same way. So and, uh, and to and to London in particular, there was I was fortunate to have. A, few offers in Toronto and the U S and in the UK and the attraction to London was um, my mother is French. I had a French passport. Okay. It, I didn't need any visa or anything like that. I, although I had spent virtually no time in London, I had spent a fair amount of time in Europe growing up, particularly France with my mother. I somehow just liked the idea of being in London. Yeah. And had this idea of like, oh, I'll go to London for a couple of years and then I'll come back to North America. And even thought I'd come back to Toronto and even kind of had this idea of which private equity firm I'd work at in Toronto a couple of years later in London. Certainly after my first year in London, I was like, wait, that was so naive. Like London is so amazing. I'm having such a great time here. I'm not going anywhere. And yeah. so what I thought was going to be two years turned into almost six years. Yeah, that's crazy. So in your first, let's talk about like your intern. Did you land a traditional internship junior year summer? Cause I, the reason I was asking for, did you know freshman years? Cause now kids, it's like some of the recruiting happens sophomore year, like early sophomore mm-hmm. year for junior year internships. Yeah. So it's like people have to know even earlier nowadays than, than when you did. Um, yeah. The, so I, yeah. So I did, yeah, I did do the summer internship. And then was that like, you just crushed it. you worked really hard. Was that in London as well? No. So I did, my summer internship at Scotiabank in Toronto and had an offer to return there and had a wonderful summer experience there. I mean, wonderful as far as <laughs> summer banking. Analysts. You like the people, you like the people. <laughs> <laughs> Let me raise a giant caveat. Sorry, I should use with that wonderful. But 80, hundred hour weeks, yeah. but you, you know, something like that. But there was an element of, listen, if I'm going to do this, let's go all out. Yeah. Let's the, the global bank in New York and London is within grasp. So let's go for it. Okay. And even you, if it meant, it meant kind of risking and re, you know, not accepting this, the offer to go back to Scotiabank full time. But I was pretty confident in myself that, I said, listen, I, did you have any, so I get that. Like I was young and very confident <laughs> at that age too. I feel yeah. like people sometimes are overconfident, especially if you've, if you've done well in high school, you've done well in school, 
Yeah. And did you ever like look at the actual numbers in terms of like, okay, how many kids are trying to get into this and how many kids place and think to yourself, I'm there? I mean, were you like close to 4 0? Like, no. Um, no, I, I had a sense of how, how, you felt how few in, in the interviews, basically. When after my summer internship, I was much more confident in the interviews. Mm -hmm. I also knew my grades were near the top of the class and they were, they I, were not, sorry. They, they, they were, they were. Okay, good. Okay. And I felt what I struggled with in recruiting for my summer internship. I just wasn't polished in my interviews. I got nervous. I didn't really know what to kind of say or do. Right. And after a summer of experience under my belt, I kind of like, you know, I kind of figured out as much as you can figure out what investment banking is after a summer. Yeah. And so when the interviews came back around, I now I knew what I was talking about. Yeah. So it's much easier. So tell me, did you feel like you turned down that full-time offer? You had to actually let it explode yep. to take the risk going in senior year. Yeah. Did that Funny turn out? Did you, so you ended up with multiple offers, but was it like, was it touch and go for so, a while there? <laughs> yeah. Funny story. If, <laughs> if you want to hear it of how yeah. I ended up accepting the Credit Suisse offer yeah, from London that. is so the Scotiabank offer had expired. I, and then there were a few other offers that I let expire as well. And then it came down to, I had an offer at Merrill Lynch in Toronto and then an offer at Houlihan Loki in um, LA, LA. no, in LA, mm -hmm. and then Morgan Stanley were kind of telling me you're, you know, you're going to get an offer from. I, I think I'm getting all those right. I may have the banks or the locations slightly wrong. And then Credit Suisse was the one kind of outstanding. Every, and the way the school was set up is by a certain date, all the offers had um, had to were had to be in and accepted. And it was that date. And I'd been kind of stringing along the various other offers that I have holding out for this Credit Suisse offer in London. That kept you really, telling you me really it was coming. To to London. Yeah, you really and that's, that's the one I wanted. And now it's, I remember I'm at school. It's four or five o'clock. Yeah, probably three, four o'clock in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time, which means it's eight o'clock in the evening in London. Mm -hmm. And I'm emailing this guy. I'd be like, what's going on here, man? Like, you know, this is the deadline. I'm, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm holding off on these other offers to accept yours. And I remember, and then I remember I was on the phone about to accept the Merrill Lynch offer. And all of a sudden, and we're like all literally on the phone exchanging pleasantries. And I get call waiting and I see it's a foreign number. And I say, listen, hold on, I'll be right back. Switch over. And it's this Italian guy from London calling me saying, sorry to get so late. I got tied up on something. But yeah, we're going to make you an offer. You know, we've got an offer for you if you want it. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, do you realize? That was, was like within a the second. Deadline in this game. Like I was literally on the phone with someone else about to accept a different offer. Wow. Split second. Yeah, I hadn't like, thought about that. <laughs> think think <laughs> of the like minutes. Like if, if it had been one longer. minute, no, if it had been like 10 minutes later, I mean, you could have theoretically read, like call the guy back, but still just the, the thought of like yeah. a 30 yeah, second and, difference or a two minute difference. Yeah. And it's great. You highlight that because you, now it's easier to see in retrospect where there's all these tiny moments and decisions in our life that totally change your trajectory. And that was one of them that in, until you brought it up now, I hadn't thought about but yeah, my life would have been totally different. Yeah, no London. <laughs> Think <Yeah>. of that. <laughs> That's very yeah. different. So okay, so you you get the job you want. Um, you you roll the dice. Well, you know, you were confident. You ended. Up, you you were obviously correct because you had multiple offers. So you were clearly nailing the interviews. You um, you kind of, I guess, were super excited. Probably you had a blast the, yeah. rest, of the, the rest of your senior year. Tell me a little yeah. bit about kind of that first, that transition into the reality of what it was like, like the move over to London must have been just like a whirlwind. Yeah. And, so it fun. Was a and fun. Yeah. It was a shock. Um, I, I, I kind of, as I you know described at the top of the, our discussion because of the day, especially the day I started, what I was walking into, mm -hmm. although I didn't know any different, it, it became pretty apparent that 
this is not normal course of business. And I'd become friends. There were a hundred or so people in my analyst class. We all went through training together. Everyone was worried. I'm a a pretty sociable guy. I, you know, I transplanted myself from an environment that I had a whole lot of friends into an environment where I literally know two people. There are two other people from my graduating class that moved to London with me. The three of us lived together. One of, one of the other guys actually worked at Credit Suisse as well. Okay. That was the extent of the friends I had in London. So I became friends with a whole bunch of other people during training. And it was fun there from mostly continental Europe. Um, and But then quickly, you know, we started in September by December, probably, a, you know, a third of the class had been fired. And then oh, wow. by kind of January into February, it was it was more and more and i remember i sat there were six how did you together. how did they fire people with like almost no experience and it's just random <laughs> yeah i i think that's another one of those moments where i just got really lucky I, did I, one of your roommates I, get fired nope okay that's good um <laughs> you didn't have to cover yeah that we <laughs> somehow all lucked out yeah um so yeah, they had fired but, yeah, by, yeah. by January, February was like almost half the class was gone. Yeah, about that. Yeah, that makes sense. And it was just a toxic environment. You know, I think banking in general has a very difficult environment mm-hmm. and overlay what was going on in the markets then. I'd be curious what banking is like right now, given we're in for even a worse the timing's uh, kind of, environment. The timing's than, interesting. The timing's really interesting because then it was fall right after everybody had started like all went down here it's been it was march where everything started Mm -hmm. unraveling and going crazy right Mm -hmm. and so you see banks coming out saying oh we're going to guarantee the full-time offers for all the interns for like i don't know how much of it is pr move or whatnot i don't know if you've seen that a lot of banks have come out saying we're going to guarantee the full-time offers but i'm like yeah that's that's for the jobs a full year what about the kids starting yeah what about the the full-time starting right now they're going to start virtually a lot of them how many of those kids are going to keep their job and it's been a little bit silent. It's it's definitely hasn't been across the street. It's been a little bit silent. So I'm worried, you know, that they're either going to start cutting quietly or, or whatnot. But um, yeah, there's a lot of parallels ten years later. But so okay, yeah. so you're um, you survive somehow. Do, do you think there's anything to do with like relationships that you formed with in training with anyone more senior? maybe the guy that had called you and gave you the offer. I don't know anything that kind of protected you like at all in retrospect, like your, your, how you performed yeah, yeah, on yes, that, how you performed yes, in training, like on the exam. Yes. Stuff like that? Po- yes, possibly. But I, yeah. I don't know definitively. Cause they were giving you like exams in the training. Yeah. Stuff. So you had all sorts of exams and stuff that they told you didn't factor into your year one analyst rating. I don't know if that's what you were told, whether or not that's true or not. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. There were certainly in the later rounds. Yes. But when I joined in, you know, f- you know, day one, starting mid September and then by early December cuts are already being made. It's really hard in those couple months to develop real relationships thereafter, you know, by the time the rounds came the following January into March, I had real relationships and the value of my work was showing up. And so I think that helped me. Yeah. Tell me but about early something on, you do. Are you in touch with anybody who did get cut in those first rounds? Do you know what would have happened to any of them? If not, that's okay. I mean, I know you probably no, you don't. No, <laughs> it, I mean, there's not now it's 12 years on and a long time ago. Yeah. yeah I wasn't, I wasn't sure if maybe there was like one that you kept in touch with and he ended up okay. He or she, um, okay. Anyway, so you're, you're going through this kind of scary time and yep. are you still working crazy hours? Or are they just pitching like crazy? Like what's the, what's the, what's it like day to day? Cause I know what it was but, it, from Oh two to Oh four when I was in banking, it was kind of like right after the Oh one. Yeah. Crisis. I know yes. Bad. Yes. Similar crisis. I guess similar but different is. Yeah. So my first couple months was, as I described, a shock for many reasons. But one of also the shocks you come out of college with this view, this kind of empowered view of, 
you know, knowing how the world works and I can add this much value. I've got all these suggestions, which is all great. And that you keep that energy, but you get cut down to size pretty quickly. Like my first task, I remember was to go to the pharmacy and take pictures of the product on the shelf for a presentation we were putting together. That was literally my job. And I remember being told that. And I was like, what are you guys talking about? Like, I'm here to build a model. Like, I can build a three statement model and like a DCF and what have you. You're like, no, just go take a photo. And, and like, no, here's a camera. Go take a picture of these products. Oh my gosh. I was like, yeah. oh. <laughs> okay, I don't see what I just, why did I do all those interviews and like do oh, all this work in college to go take pictures? Did of you eventually? Products I mean, a pharmacy. So, I yes, asked. I then, then I eventually, you know, there's the first few months as an analyst, you're doing that type of work. Yeah. It, maybe it's changed now, but it was kind of real grunt work and it was printing pitch books and so so on and so forth. And then occasionally you'd get something more interesting, model oriented. And that was what I was really interested in doing, all sorts of the modeling stuff. And then that's what you wanted. And then there's an element of like, be careful what you wish for, because sooner or later, that's all I was doing. And I was inundated by it. And I was building. Okay, oh, because if you were good, then they just give you more, right? They'll yeah. They'll give and, you as much as you can handle. Yeah. I ended up on this one deal that was this company, UC Rosal, which is the, I believe it still is the case, the largest aluminum ma manufacturer in the world, this Russian company owned by, it was going public. We were taking it through this form of restructuring. It was massively over levered. And then as you know, commodities came crashing down, mm -hmm. it had to restructure a whole lot of its debt. It had to, it was going to IPO to do it was all this. Kind so of let me guess, you had to you had to basically run about five hundred uh, capital structure scenarios uh, through your through some complex waterfall model with like five hundred layers of debt and <laughs> yes, that and then also we had with the company we worked through this kind of this operating model of optimizing kind of. With the raw material that's used to make aluminum, where that comes from, the cost of shipping that through the different facilities, what the cost is of each of those different facilities, and depending on the transportation costs, you'd shift, you send it to different facilities, and then even just the revenue you, bill you, was insane. Oh, uh, and then yeah. you know different aluminum prices, and it was that was just a, a total mess. Sounds and that very, was very similar to my experience. six plus months of my life where that's the only deal I worked on. And we had update meetings every Monday in Moscow, which I obviously did not go to. Mm -hmm. And it meant that there was all sorts of iterations of analysis that had to be done and updates of presentations over the weekend for Monday morning, which meant pretty much every, not for the full six months, but I forget now, but easily three months of it, practically every Sunday, I pulled an all-nighter. <laughs> and then like, yeah, you, have I, to, you have to be there Monday through Friday. You can't like not show up on Monday, right? Even People would roll into the office Monday morning yeah. and I was still there in my jeans and t-shirt from my Sunday. That's, <laughs> That's a good look, man. It's a good look. You're like, what are you doing? Not, not ideal. Um, and so that kind of built you know, for me, did you at least I get was, to go out Saturday nights <laughs> with your buddies? I, yeah, Sometimes. yeah. Occasionally, Friday or Saturday, we'd have yeah. these blowout nights, and you'd wake up the next morning viciously hungover and have to go. And in. it was okay. I, I guess I got to go in the office now. Yeah, yeah. I remember those days. It's not. Um, a, you're getting little sleep, and then you go party, and you're just like, "What did I do?" <laughs> yeah, you just need some sort of stress relief. Yeah. Right. And that's the easiest, most accessible one. Mm -hmm. And that's what you do. Or that's what I guess what we did. Um, yeah. But yeah. So in, I had, a, you know, that experience kind of on, on repeat mm -hmm. and going into banking, knowing, listen, this, what I'd understood of banking already, it probably wasn't what I wanted to do long term. Mm -hmm. I viewed it more as a stepping stone into investing. Even back from my college days, that was kind of the trajectory I saw. There were many other 
alumni of the school of Ivy that had come, had that done a similar thing. So that path was pretty well laid out. Yeah. You didn't say that in the banking interviews, but you kind of had that. In no. Your, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you knew no. you wanted to be an investor. You want to be buy side. So hey, tell me about your thought process, private equity versus um, hedge fund and all that stuff. Did you do like on cycle private equity recruiting at all? Out yep. there? Yeah. Tell yeah. Me so, I, about that. so I did that. That kind of came first interviewed with a bunch of the, the large private equity firms and I was kind of into it, but it, it seemed from the outside like a repeat of banking. Everyone's wearing suits, there's titles, there's structures, there's deal teams, there's staffers. And one thing that I didn't like about banking is the, you know, you were rewarded for taking kind of a company from A to B. And once you'd done that a number of times, it was so process oriented. It was like, you know, just figure out how to make the sausage and then just keep making that sausage over and over again. Mm -hmm. And that just, I just, after a while, once you figure it out, I was like, I feel like I kind of, you know, I, I learned what I wanted to learn here. And some people really strive in that environment. And it was just, like it just didn't interest me all that much and that was just a personal you felt like yeah you felt like in private equity would be similar right you'd be just be doing the LBA. yeah and i felt i felt private equity was like i'm just gonna do this a, a lot more the same thing and then i started speaking to friends that i'd made that worked at different hedge funds and someone said well listen we're send me your resume maybe i can you know i can get you an interview or let's talk more about kind of different investing and then yeah, then I started interviewing at a few different hedge funds. Had you been and investing personally on the side, like already? I yeah. had in college, and then by the time banking rolled around, no time. I just didn't have any time, and so so no. So how'd you get ready for the interviews? Develop your a couple long pitches, a couple short pitches, kind of thing, or no? Honestly, I don't remember. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, like I'm yeah, sure when you walked I, in, they're like, "Hey, get tell me." tell me a company you like or whatever or something like that right so you had to be yeah from memory i think most of there were not necessarily stock pitches per se mm -hmm. but a lot of it was okay let's talk about something you really know and they you know we talk about a deal i was working on which since i'd spent six months on this one particular deal i, I knew everything about it and they'd say okay let's kind of look at it from the perspective of an investor what do you think about this company why would you buy what valuation how would, and, and so that became a lot of the discussion or it was the impromptu stock pitch or more similar to my understanding of um uh, consulting interviews where you do these on the spot case studies yeah of you know i've got this company it kind of does this what would you want to know about it and you have this back and forth discussion so you, you knew enough about like having done restructuring having done a little i mean a little bit of everything you you felt pretty comfortable being able to kind of dig in in terms of thinking that like an investor and you did okay on those or did you did you like practice with anybody like any mentors that helped you kind of get ready for those or just you, you were naturally yeah I, yeah i had um a few friends who were already either at private equity firms or at hedge funds and talk yeah. to them what the interview process was like. We discuss kind of what to, what to say, what to highlight. Mm -hmm. My roommate was also him and I. This was the other guy Perfect. from Ivy who we lived together. He worked at Credit Suisse. Him and I were going through interviews at the same time, so we would go back and forth and together. Yeah, too. yeah, and he's still there. Well, he <laughs> ended up actually. So we both. Um, interviewed at gso and he ended up getting the job i did not and yeah. <laughs> plus there. years later he's yeah we're still great friends and he's still there that's, that's awesome so okay so, yeah. you... so that that was more the type of interview that i had and the questions were like okay where in the capital stack would you invest where's their value what's the lever what's the full come security yeah the, yeah, so there was that was kind of the credit oriented interview. Some of the stuff was more equity oriented. Mm -hmm. What they were, what they were really interested in discovering, and then I later did a whole lot of these interviews at, at Blue Mound. Well, we were considering hiring different people, and at least the first interview, especially for someone that junior, it was more. Let's let's just have an open conversation of which the candidate is going to lead the conversation on how they go about thinking about a business and a potential investment. And let's just see where this goes. It doesn't really matter what you talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what they, company or anything. It's more about your thought process and the thesis and 
yeah, it's the kind of how would you go about developing a, a thesis, mm-hmm. right? And what kind of differentiates you from everybody else out there? Right. What differentiates totally. your kind of thesis or your edge from what uh, kind of what the market per se is thinking about? Right. And what are the levers in the company thinking through like the revenue drivers, price versus volume, what the cost structure is like, fixed cost versus variable, what the cash flow is like. So getting into some of those kind of technicalities, but understanding kind of high level what makes a good business and what attributes of whatever it is we're talking about make it a good business or bad business. And then how can we balance that where with valuation? Totally. Love Those it. were generally kind of the points to, to, hit to, on. to hit on. And then thereafter, both in kind of my interview process, which was, I was kind of a year or so into banking, then you'd get a case study. And that's really when you get more into detail. Like kind of, they'd tell you the company to look at and like come back and pitch this to us. Got it. Okay. So it obviously went well. You got an offer. Was this like your second or third interview at a fund you actually wanted? Or was this, did you kind of get better and better as you went along? Was it? Yeah, you certainly get better and better as you go along. I had interviewed with a few private equity firms mm-hmm. and got fairly far. And then there were a couple interviews. Like well, it doesn't have to be exact, but it wasn't like your first interview. No, it was, it your was second not my or first third. Interview. It was like your second or third, basically yeah okay so you you get the offer are you like ecstatic is it like a year yeah is it a year before like you finish (laughs) at credit zero it was probably eight months months. or so okay so not super early yeah okay you had to finish that out was it tough to finish that out and work those hours when you knew you had that other offer lined up and were the bonuses horrible because it was 2009 2010 (laughs) i assume they weren't I, I, it was still good. I, again, I yeah. had no prior bench. It was a whole lot of money that more money than I was making before, which was zero. Right. <laughs> so it's still right. good on an hourly basis. It was bad regardless of how you, you cut it. <laughs> uh, yeah. The, I mean, the last several months of banking, I'll admit I was, I was coasting and I think everybody became aware. It becomes pretty obvious <laughs> who's leaving. Yeah. And so when I submitted my resignation letter, I was like, yeah, gotcha. Like, we're not surprised by this. Yeah. And did they, oh, so you didn't tell them before, like you got the bonus, you have the bonus clear. And then you told them. Yeah. That was kind of, was, at least then what everybody did. Got it. Okay. And then, so you moved on. Tell me about like that transition. What was it? What was, I mean, it sounded like it was super interesting. You were, yeah, special situations credit analyst for, you know, investing in European credits during mm-hmm. the sovereign debt crisis in Europe. So tell me a little, I know you can't tell like maybe specific trades or anything like that, but was there, what was the learning curve like? Did you have like a mentor when you first joined? What, like the day to day, like, I assume there's no training where they just like, hey, look at this. When you like, who, yes, who so, took you under the wing? Like, what, what's the process so, like? Yeah. I know very little about hedge funds since I never did. Yeah. yeah. Unlike banking, very unstructured. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's no formal training. There's no, this is your title. And then a couple of years later, you've got this other title. It's very little hierarchy. And, you know, if, if you can roll with this, you can figure out how this works and make money. Like you get a whole lot more, um, autonomy early on. And that's kind of what attracted me. You know, we, we were talking about kind of hedge funds or private equity versus hedge funds and the conversation went kind of sideways, but mm-hmm. not sideways, but we, there were other topics discussing, but one of the things that attracted me about joining a hedge fund is having that autonomy and that responsibility early on, if I merited it and didn't have to wait for some arbitrary time horizon and, right. and, um, and, um, and kind of job title. So tell me about that progression because you were there for a long time. Yeah. So, I so was, I'd love to hear. I like, was there for eight plus years, almost nine years, which in in, in hedge fund terms is like, and it's practically an eternity. You're a veteran. And none of my n- none of my friends stayed at a hedge fund at least so far that long. Um, I so when I did join, I had an incredible mentor, this woman who became a partner at the firm and kind of took me under the wing, and I worked directly with her. Mm. 
and she kind of showed me the ropes. And then as I got more comfortable, I was given kind of more latitude. And then I started putting, you know, I got a chance to put on my, you know, my first position. How much was that? Do you mind sharing? Just out of curiosity. No, I don't. I mean, so this was within the European portfolio. And at the time, the European portfolio was like a few hundred million. Mm -hmm. And I mean, part of this was them just giving me like the position size was kind of meaningless. It was, we managed, yeah, Europe at that time was several hundred million. And mm -hmm. this position, my first position was probably, we grew it to 20 million. Mm -hmm. Like huge from, you know, like yeah. my standpoint. Like, oh my gosh, yeah, the, I'm responsible for that idea. And it's, you know, yeah, yeah, but I hope it goes as, right. <laughs> yeah. And as kind of like a 23, 24 year old, I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> like this is huge. As in the scope of like the firm overall, it like it it's small, right? It was small, but, you know, fast forward a few years, then all of a sudden the position sizes are getting, you know, many multiples of that. And right. it's, you know, it's starting to have a real impact. And so you start really realizing the impact of some of your decisions. And, you know, people kind of looking at you of, hey, what's going on here? You know, we've lost a lot of money here, or hey, great job, we've made a lot of money here. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about <laughs> you talked about like, there, it's pretty flat. So you had that mentor initially, how long was she kind of served? She went all the way up as a partner. So she was getting promoted, or I guess promoted you know, you can call yourself a hedge fund analyst. It doesn't really matter. You're kind of yeah. all up working as a team. It sounds like it's more flat, but was she kind of always ahead of you pulling you through or was it just, when did you kind of just start, you started, that was your first trade. Then the, when did you actually start doing a lot more of that? Um, so you were under the sovereign book, like the $200 million sovereign, sovereign book for a while. Which yeah, I think it was, I mean, the, the Europe portfolio quickly grew to over a billion. Okay. Um, and, and how many how many other investment or hedge fund analysts were there with you alongside you? Ten? In, in no, in London there was four of us maybe. Four. And so there was kind of the billion of capital that was for Europe, and then there was other pockets of capital that was technically based in the U.S., but that we could tap into for other investments in Europe. So the amount of capital was like pretty kind fluid. Yeah. And so if there were some things that would fit in the European portfolio go in that, so it would also fit in other portfolios, technically other funds. Right. And then if a certain opportunity came up that that like didn't really fit the profile of the European portfolio, then there was no kind of bigger distress portfolio that was technically based in New York could invest in it. Tell me a little bit about how you just had the confidence. Like, so it's one thing to get ready for an interview, talk through an investment, talk through a company. Tell me how like then all of a sudden you're you're thrown into like learn credit. Um, you had a little bit of restructuring, so I guess that helps. But tell me how you got confident enough. Was it just was it a year before you kind of put this position on? Was it only six months, three months? And I think then the first yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Interrupt you continue. No, yeah. Okay, so so my so my first position I probably put on within eight months of being there. Yeah. So there were other positions that I was working on and working in tandem with this wonderful mentor of mine who her and I continue to be great friends. Mm -hmm. And so those were kind of co-owned positions. She was certainly the lead. She was the one making the decision, but she was instrumental in me in me understanding what was going on and kind of guiding me towards the analysis we should be doing and helping me think through the conclusions we should draw from the analysis where we were doing and where we could potentially be wrong and then translating that analysis into different instruments in the capital structure or derivatives of that in the form of cds so that was kind of a big insight for me because you what I found, at least my experience in banking and in college before that, you know, you're you're value you're always valuing the the company as a whole, the enterprise value, the equity value. But when it comes to credit, then there's an element of that, but you also need to figure out the price of a specific security within that capital stack. Yes, yeah, right. Tranche of debt, a levered loan, yeah. a high yield bond, and you know some sort of subordinated bonds, and so you can't do a DCF to get to a price of the bond, right? right? And so there's an element of absolute value of like what the business could be, 
worth, what the fulcrum security is, but then there's also an element of like relative value of, okay, well, if these bonds in a similar company are trading at this value, then these other bonds should be trading here. And the type of investing within that period, and that period being kind of 10, 11, 12, changed a lot as well. So there were periods where you know, you could buy a high yield bond, you know, maybe B or double B rated in a average business with a few turns of leverage that was yielding 15%. And you're like, this is a, you know, this is a great investment for like kind of risk relative to, to the reward we were getting. And then thereafter, there was a lot more kind of distress stuff we were doing. And so there was a kind of tr- the rapid learning curve across, you know, performing credit kind of things on the, and then distress on the one side and then kind of a lot of stuff in between. It's really cool. <laughs> you yeah, learned, you probably learned a lot. Yeah. So tell yeah. me like, so you tell me, were there, um, so you put on that first position, was it a winner? Yeah, we made money on it. It was a short, I shorted the bonds of this company called back and and yeah. They went down. down. <laughs> we, we, yeah, yeah, we made money on it. I think the they traded down. Did you guys cover? Did you guys cover? Yeah, the bonds probably like traded down like 10, 15 points, and we covered, and That's yeah, great. it felt good. And then after that, I was like, "This is really cool." And then more positions came, and then so I was a lot of ideas on, kind of morph from previous ideas, and like you're constantly kind of yeah. So in I was responsible for a few sectors in Europe, mm-hmm. um, and then. I started within those sectors, there were some distressed things. So then I started working with some of the kind of special distressed focused kind of analysts, PMs who are based in New York. And so we started working together. And then there were a few equity ideas that I started to come up with. And we had just kind of launched a long short equity strategy in New York. And so I started pitching ideas to that portfolio. So at one point, I kind of found myself with sort of three different bosses, like the kind of direct boss in London, this other distressed portfolio manager I was working with in New York and then this long short equity portfolio I was working with. Was that because you were just coming up with ideas that applied to different different parts? Yeah. And yeah. so they were just like, yeah, sure. Whatever. Yeah. I just wanted. like, I, I kind of figured out how some of the performing credit stuff works some of the stress stuff worked, And I was like, I'm interested in distress. There's a whole lot of stress going on. And I was like, Hey, this kind of distress opportunity is coming up in, you know, is happening. I'd email them, we'd get on the phone, we'd talk about it, and they'd be like, okay, if you want to look at this, go for it. And then there was some other equity thing that I'd kind of like, I think this is kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. And then I'd pitch it to them and they'd be like, okay, yeah, go for it. Start working. How did you and, how did you kind of evolve with like the first few years there in terms of trying to come up with good ideas, trying to be responsive, like the hours? Because I, you know, with banking, it's like you're told when you can go to the bathroom, when you can stand up and sit down. I, I assume with hedge funds, is, there's there's no structure. It's very unstructured. So it's really no. the ideas you're coming up with. So you could be working 24 hours a day or at least think dreaming about it in, your, in the little sleep you get. And it can be probably very stressful because your positions are moving every day, right? So yeah. tell me about how you manage that. So you you certainly take take work home with you. Not in the sense that you have to, you know, work around the clock, but it became pretty hard to detach yourself from the positions you had. You were kind of always thinking about it and, you know, I'd go about my daily life and you just became what's very observant of trends and businesses and kind of what's going on. And you walk into a store and be like, wow, there's a lot of people in here. What are they selling? This must be pretty cool. I wonder who owns this business. What's going And, you know, there was always that stuff going on or realizing like, oh, this business could be a competitor to, you know, some investment that we have on. Like, I didn't think of that. We should kind of reconsider. So your mind is always going on, you know, a new investment idea or a threat to an existing investment idea and kind of spotting trends. As to the actual idea generation early on, it was a combination. Early on, it was often someone at the firm telling me like this looks interesting you should look at it got it and then that then later evolved into me coming up with my own ideas and is there any guidance at all in terms of like when they expect that to happen like you obviously they liked what you were doing you were there for so long and they're probably your idea there were enough we're hitting (laughs) where yeah you know 
I don't yeah. recall a specific expectation of like by this date you need to have positions on. And maybe that's because it was happening naturally. Yeah. And so like me. tell me how how it grew. Like, did somebody sit you down? Like when they're paying you your bonus at the end of the year. I mean, there's a boss. You have a boss. Yeah. So are they telling you, like, oh, you did a great job this year? Here, they cut you these massive checks. <laughs> like what <laughs> what was it like? Like, I mean, cause cause banking, I, I assume you're getting paid a lot more. Um, in the hedge fund, and you don't have to tell us the exact rate, but is there a range? Like, were you getting you're still in London, so you're getting like a hundred thousand pounds the, or something? Or? So the so the range over the course of my hedge fund career, the range I mean, the payouts changed good. dramatically. Makes sense. The, in the initial kind of couple of years, it was listen, we're after probably like a six or 12 month period, there was this realization of, okay, this guy seems pretty smart and he's really into this. So we want to keep him around and we're going to kind of mentor him, but there wasn't the expectation of delivering PNL. And then probably by my second year there, certainly my third year there, there was an expectation of creating PNL. And like, did you ask for that? Or they just started saying, Hey, Eric, we're going to give you a hundred to manage. It was like, Hey, you're going to start managing this. So like, I never, those I never meetings, actually, like where, where was it like communicated to you that you, earn that or like all of a sudden you're so in so you'd have the various and kind of review yeah. and the PL was very apparent right we had all these systems where everybody at the firm could see who had what position and how much money it was making or losing so that was very transparent yeah right and so it became very evident to everyone at the firm like who's making money who's losing money what was less transparent is how that converted into right your payout at the end of the year there was some sort of magic box that no one ever really knew. And that's what, you what, came, to... what went into it and what came out of it. And then you, you mind sharing your best year, what you made. I mean, probably crazy at the end, right? You were there for eight years. <laughs> uh, no, because my best year was not at the end of the year, because there were a number of, to have a really big year, there were a number of things I had to align. One, I had to produce PL. Two, the strategy I was working in specifically so to be clear i did the dist- kind of the credit stuff in europe and then when i moved to new york which i spent four years in long short equity in new york still at the same firm at blue mountain but we had you know this under a then second mentor this one of the probably like the best bosses i've ever had mm-hmm. and who he was instrumental in kind of forming a lot of my thinking and my investment acumen and um yeah so the, you know i had to do well the strategy had to do well and the firm overall had to do well you had kind of those three things had to hit and so in years where my pnl may have been better but if the firm didn't do well or the strategy didn't do well then like the payout wasn't there like not there at all like but it's still there i mean you guys still got a bonus it just yeah listen we it still wasn't multiple it wasn't multiple instead of being 300 percent of your salary it's like you know 80 percent or 100 percent or something like that you know yeah and there there were also there was a massive range in what the different people i suspect like no one ever really talked about this but i suspect there was a pretty massive range in what the different people at the firm were making and like understandably so there were a few people who every year were driving big pnl drivers or maybe not every year but what became pretty what became kind of evident and i suspect is the case that like most funds is you have a you know you have a small small number of people and it's you know and as a result that small number of positions that make the majority of the PL in any given one year but the people who are the contributors of that kind of change every few years interesting it's really cool so you you were able to see that even early on they let you see that the tra- is that yeah. transparent that's yeah. cool yeah i mean um, like you knew you know every if not every day certainly every week you know we'd be reviewing PL. Does there looking any, at the different at any positions. point in your eight years, did you feel like you had a bad run and you're like, I'm going to lose my job? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What year, what year was that? Year four, year five? Uh, year six? That was probably so. Um, by that point, I was in New York and. Like year six or seven. Yeah. And since I'd switched into this new role and long short equity. Well, maybe you're doing too many and, shorts in, in bull market. <laughs> no, part of it no? was, I, you know, I. Yes. Yeah. So I listen. I got my face ripped off on a few shorts, <laughs> and um, but yeah, there was a time where I just um, 
I felt like I wasn't, you know, I wasn't finding enough positions. And so I didn't have enough risk on. And so it wasn't the fact that my positions were bad. It was more fact that like, I wasn't getting enough positions on. And it was, you know, I just, you're too much in cash. Y- yeah. And so I was like, Oh, this, you know, this could be the end of me here. Like, I'm just not, you know, I'm, I'm here. I'm working my hardest I've ever worked, but I'm not coming up with great ideas. And it's hard because you want to put positions on to show that like, listen, I've done all this work and like, I've got these new positions in, in the portfolio. But if those positions end up losing money, you know, you've sunk yourself into an even bigger hole. You're better off how you would have been better off doing all that work and literally doing nothing. Right. And you would have been better off. And it's probably hard. And so th- as everyone kept yeah, saying that- 14, 15, 16, everyone's like, it's over the market's about overvalued, overvalued, overvalued. Everyone's waiting for that turn. Yes. It never came. Psychologically, <laughs> that really starts playing mind tricks with you. Yeah, because you're thinking it's coming. I got I gotta hold out. Yeah. No. So our yes, but our form of investing especially uh, long short equity. We were very much fundamental long-term investors. We had a very concentrated long portfolio Mm -hmm. and we, you know, we weren't like macro investors. We were aware of what was going on at the overall level, kind of at the economic level and markets level, but we were never trying to call where the market was going. Makes sense. It's just super interesting because I never, I mean, you were there for so long. You really got to see such a wide variety of like different groups and from London to New York. It's really interesting. It's really, yeah. I bet there's very few people that have kind of seen the inner workings of a large hedge fund like that from different perspectives and different asset classes. Yeah. So it's, yeah. And having seen cool. it grown so dramatically. Was that a lot of pressure I, when the, the, when the assets under management came, they like grew so much or were, were you guys able to hire enough kind of where there was enough manpower um, to help kind of get more positions to work? Or was that part of the problem when you came to New York was like, there's just so much money to put to work and you just didn't feel. Sure. Cause I know well, that's, I mean, a, we, that's we, a, we, we listen, we hired a, a lot of people. Um, I had an, incredible experience at the firm and like look back on my experience with the fondest of memories and there were a few people at the firm that were instrumental in my you know professional development and also development as an individual who I'm still in close contact with today in terms of how the you know the firm was managed um you know as is the case with any business, there are going to be great decisions made. There's also going to be poor decisions made. And that's just a product of, you know, building a, what becomes a pretty big firm. So tell me why, what, tell me kind of what prompted you, I guess, in terms of, you know, next steps and you're thinking you said earlier, like, is this it? Yeah. When did those thoughts start? Was it, did those start thoughts start creeping in when performance started kind of going down or we were you able to recover and then, you know, you were, you're still. No, no, it wasn't performance related. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, if anything, like my performance was better. It was getting better. Uh, yeah. And listen, like everybody hits a streak of bad performance. No, I know. It's, yeah, that's it, like, it's, it's yeah. inevitably going to, like, you're going to lose money. It's just, it's part of the business and like, you need to be able to handle that. And for me, more what it came to was, and maybe there was an element of maturity or maturing in this, but I started having the realization, like, is this really what my life is going to be? Like showing up to an office in midtown Manhattan or like any place for that matter and kind of staring at computer screens all day and, you know, starting to realize that there wasn't that much meaning in what I was doing and maybe the meaning was never really there and it took me a while to discover it or the, you know, the maturity thing I alluded to, maybe that was part of it, but I just kind of the sensation that my life had plateaued, you know, I had kind of. What about relationships? You know, I know you said you have a cover now, but like in terms of relationships, were there any long-term relationships, any broken so marriages that, along the way? or So, anything like so no, no broken marriages, but yeah. that was, that was part of it as well. That mm-hmm. my job had started to consume my entire life like it's all i did Mm -hmm. and there was no you know meaningful intimate relationships for a solid decade Mm -hmm. 
right? And it was a combination of me not prioritizing it and prioritizing work. And um, do you feel you know, that's like also, done lasting damage to you, like uh, emotionally? It, it, uh, it, I don't know. We don't want to make it like I, Dr. Phil here, but I just no, I no, no. no. But it's, I, I so think it's an funny, important question. Much, I've, been, yeah. I've been working on it on an essay or kind of that'll be on my blog shortly that delves specifically into this mm -hmm. of and um, so permanent. Did it have a permanent effect on me? no because i realized it but it's taken a lot of work over the last couple of years and what i there you know so i left i left the firm i then spent the better part of a year plus kind of totally detaching from that world and traveling kind of all over the world doing a whole bunch of stuff that i wanted to i like i wanted to have an adventure i wanted to go out and do some like kind of weird funky things that like I never would have thought of before. I never had the kind of, or didn't like have the what, chance previously. Like what? Like what? Like skydiving so, or whatever, like just getting yeah, so, so So there was, yes, I did go skydiving. <laughs> there was a whole lot more than that, that yeah. I wanted to feel kind of liberated and free to do things kind of at the drop of a hat. Mm. Right. There was an element of, I just need to detach myself from this kind of hedge fund cocoon that I'd been living in, that that was everything in my life, that there's more to life than, than just that. And so you think right? some, of, them, some and, of it was maturity, some of it was like a need for something else. Some of it was maybe you're just, you woke up and, one day, was it like a sudden no, thing? It was or gradual. Was it it was gradual. Yeah. I had been considering leaving for a solid year probably before I did. And there were elements of like kind of my departure of all, all of a sudden, a whole lot of things came together that I was like, okay, this is... I'm gonna go Big do time. This. And you had been saving um, and you didn't, did you own any real estate at that point? Nope. Anymore? No, I was totally liquid. Yeah. That's mm. great. <laughs> so no, you had freedom. Um, yeah. And in that listen, sense, it's not like, yeah, but listen, it's not like I made a like kind of fortune and it was like, Oh, I can, I don't need to work. Like that's not, I don't want to give that, that impression at all. Yeah. Um, do you mind sharing of, around with like, had you made millions of dollars, like, you know, 5 million plus or under that? No, under that. Under that. Okay. So yeah, you weren't like set for life necessarily. No, okay. no. There was a realization that like, listen, I'm going to have to go back to work at some, at some point, point. Right. But like you're not, you're not like, also like, what's, what's the point? I said, you know, I remember being asked, what are you doing with your money? I was like, well, I'm like I don't, you know, not much. I mean, it was invested and so forth, but yeah. And they're like, well, what's the point of this money? If you're not going to do anything with it. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. And also I'd started to realize like this whole idea of I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to work from the time I get out of college until I can retire at like 60 or have one career. I was like, this is nonsense. Like, why can't I enjoy like a year of retirement now? There's all sorts of things that I can do now that I'm not going to be able to do at 60 years old. Right. I want to like, I wanted to become a great skier and I spent, you know, and 20 you know the year i took off i spent like over 50 days skiing that's just something i wanted to get really good at and it was amazing and i wanted to have the ability to kind of go on trips at the you know drop of a hat and do those trips alone meet interesting people along the way i wanted to be in kind of an unstructured environment and what came out of there was whole lots of insights that came out of that but you were asking me specifically earlier around you know, were there lasting kind of relationship damages? Yeah, or, that... or something you felt like, like, for example, when you would start having a, did start having a real relationship, were there things where like you felt you were underdeveloped in that area? Oh, yeah. I, yeah, <laughs> like immature, like you're still a 22 year old. I barely, I barely had my relationship training wheels on. <laughs> <laughs> and so one of the things that I found started to, that I had adopted from being an investor that permeated all aspects of my life, which was detrimental. Great attribute as an investor, but the problem with me it permeated all aspects of my life was that to be a good investor, it, you wanted to detach the emotional connection to a decision. Right. And there was, it was too easy to think like, Oh, I'd spent all this time, researching this investment and putting it on that like how can i possibly cut this like i'm you know this is my baby i've like worked so hard for this 
And so I prided myself on kind of optimizing decision making and making unbiased decisions, which served me really well in my investment career. The problem was that that then started to permeate all aspects of my life, particularly like relationships and dating, where I would assess a you know, a relationship, a date, like I would an investment. And there were kind of like <laughs> pros and cons. And like, I wouldn't let myself feel those feelings could because I thought, well, those feelings will just obfuscate, you know, <laughs> whatever. the perfect or, or, decision, or, right? Yeah, the perfect decision. And that's nonsense when it comes to relationship, but it took kind of get stepping outside of that world and mm-hmm. taking the kind of year off mm-hmm. to realize that and think, wow, I was really doing that and that served me no benefit in intimate relationships and relationships with other friends. Mm -hmm. I really lacked empathy and kind of connecting with people like my emotional. You were trained to like completely throw the emotions in the trash. (laughs) Whether or not I was, whether or not I was trained to do that or Or I somehow developed the idea that this is what you need to do to be a good investor. Like that's, that's what I did. I think it's pretty common knowledge. People say like, yeah, remove emotion from decision. Like you have to have control of your emotions. And it's like, even like with poker, if you get upset with, after you have a bad beat and then you just go on tilt and you start pushing, um, it can become, you can lose a lot of money that way. I think I lost you for a second. Yeah. I was just saying that it's kind of like poker when you, um, if you have a bad beat and you feel like you need to push all in, you get, you get really flustered and angry. And so then you start playing more hands than you should. It's, yeah. a, it's almost like <laughs> you got to remove the emotion from it and just play optimal poker. Yeah. And train yourself. And to do that. You see train. So that was all my, that was a lot of my training and that served me well on investing and still does. But now having a more of an awareness of when that's creeping into other relationships where it really serves the benefit. What do you think, what, any advice you'd give to young professionals that just starting out their hedge fund career or thinking to go in there in terms of how to maybe keep some, some semblance of balance. Yeah. Which I was not good at. I don't think many people are. I think it's really hard. Especially in a job like that where it's high stress and, you know. Yeah. But to be truthful, I spent, I find it ironic how I spent, so little time thinking through some of the most important decisions of your life, right? Who you're going to spend your time with and within that kind of intimate relationships Mm -hmm. and what your vocation is going to be. Right. Yet I would analyze (laughs) to like the nth degree, all the different permutation of an investment or, or so forth, which like, yes, we're important, but in the grand scheme of life, were they that important? Like, no, not really. And, and you weren't through kind of, college and my career initially like you're not really trained to think about those bigger life questions right and so i rarely and for the, certainly the big part of my initial career i rarely like step back and thought through more what is it that i want to do right i found this path kind of going back to my days in college where like oh go to banking then go join this hedge fund then you know climb the ranks of you know be a better like hedge fund guy and then that's it. And it kind of got to the point where like, I got there, I did that. And it was like, so tell me how, so, like, so, like, so what? And so the advice I would share to people kind of starting along that path is it's difficult at the outset because you don't have any experience, but as you start to accumulate more experience, instead of what I did of just seeing what was the next milestone, 12 to 24 months ahead of time, the next job, the next promotion, the next bonus, whatever really think through like is this really something you want to be doing and why you're doing it and if are you doing it from a place of insecurity or a place of inspiration and i think a lot of my decisions were made from a place of insecurity right i at the time i didn't realize it but a lot of what i was doing whether it was the banking job the banking job at a global firm the banking job in london and the hedge fund job and at the big hedge fund and like more responsible and so forth is because i sought the validation of all the people in that world hmm. right that made me feel good but yeah. that only gets you so far right and then eventually that applause runs out and you're kind of left thinking like okay like kind of what now and that's so what is where i got to now? Yeah. What's now for you? And, and 
<laughs> I know you said it's hard to describe, but you've been kind of you've investing, you've been investing some startup stuff like that. Yeah. So to be honest, I don't totally know what now is, mm-hmm. and being okay with that. Previously, you know, since college till recently, I knew what now was. I knew what I was doing, mm-hmm. or so I thought. Right. It was. I could fool myself into thinking that, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Cause it made sense. You'd latch onto it. It was, you know, that was your identity, right? right? I put a lot of weight in my identity as a hedge fund guy. And then once you shed that, it's like, oh, wait, like, what am I, what am I actually doing now? And so there's been a f- one, just being okay with not knowing exactly what you want to do is mm-hmm. fine. And in, I would argue it's actually you know, could be better than fooling yourself into thinking you're doing the right thing because it's, because that's the easier alternative. And it, and it was for me for the longest time. I think and, that's, I, I agree with, I think it's important to always have that introspection and, and kind of broader perspective. I think it's hard though. I think it's easier said once you run in your shoes. I do yeah. just because, just because you totally, you have the little bit of the cushion, right. For the, for the kids who don't have, who have a lot of debt you know, for the kids who just need to grind, like I get it. Like if we're putting their head down and just, just getting that check to help, yeah. help their family and, or whatnot. Um, you know what I mean? And absolutely. And by no means am I suggesting don't do that. Mm-hmm. I'm encouraging along the way, think through yes. why you're doing it. And that's huge. And, yeah, and yeah. that's, that's what I missed out on. Right mm-hmm. now I have, you know, I don't really have a regret about the decisions I made or I had this wonderful experience and it required that experience to get to the place I am now. Mm-hmm. And I'm search- and I'm much happier in where I am now than I have been in years. That's great. Well, I've kept you for way too long, but <laughs> tell me a little bit of that. So any, any kind of parting advice before we call it, or anything else you want to talk about before we, we call it and samuelandrew.com if you want to read some of Sam's, uh, Sam's post, but anything else? Like anything, any parting words of wisdom <laughs> not to put you on the spot? Part, <laughs> yeah. Parting words of wisdom is um, trying we're far more in control of our environment and our situation than we think we are. And realizing that you do have the choice to, whether it's going to banking or an hedge fund job, whatever career, or the choice to not do that, you're continually making that choice every day you're showing up to work and realizing that, you know, if you're not enjoying the environment that you're in, Life's kind of too short to keep doing the thing you're not enjoying doing and making that choice again and realizing that like, you know what, what's the worst case that could happen? And then realizing in my case, like the worst case wasn't that bad. I said, okay, I take six months out of this, 12 months out of this. I was able to get this job before I'll be able to go back and get it. Mm -hmm. And so what if I'm, you know, I've missed out on a year of compensation or I've missed out you know, my peers are now ahead of me. Like, so what I'm going to, you know, I'm going to work for a big part of my life and kind of putting that in, you know, putting that in perspective. Um, Cause I think we become, and I fell victim of this of being a bit too short-term oriented that it's hard to leave because this next payout is coming or this next promotion is coming. But thinking of that, payout or that promotion over the course of your entire life, you start to realize that like, wait a second, this is actually, it's not as meaningful as you think it is. And so having that larger perspective to choose things over again. It's great. I love it. I think, uh, I think the the listeners need to hear that oftentimes, especially people in our audience. So um, thank you for taking the time, right. sharing your wisdom and uh <laughs> Really appreciate right, it. It's really interesting yeah. perspective. So thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. And thanks to you, my listeners at Wall Street Oasis. If you have any suggestions whatsoever, please don't hesitate to send them my way, Patrick at wallstreetoasis.com. And until next time.